Okay. Um, yes, so we're moving to the life sciences, and I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor John Lovengrub. Uh, Professor Lovengrub, uh, he did his PhD in applied mathematics at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences in uh, New York. And then after holding various positions in universities, like in Minnesota, he moved to UC Irvine, where, as you can see from his affiliation, he's a professor in the Department of Mathematics in Biomedical Engineering, Chemical Engineering, and Material Sciences. And actually, he's uh, co-directing uh, the program on systems, targets, and pathways. Did I say it correctly? At the Chow Center for Complex uh, Biological uh, Systems. Um, I want to say a few other things than just data about John. I have been reading his work since my early time, since the first days of my PhD. His early work was on vortex methods, and that's where I did my PhD on. And I thought in inviting him here, it's a good opportunity to show that computational science is also very much about mathematics and strong mathematics applied to very difficult problems without forgetting um, uh, what mathematics uh, means. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, visit Zurich my second time, but uh, it's great to be back. Um, this, I'm going to talk about uh, mathematical models of cancer, and it's joint work with a, a number of people um, Arthur Lander, who is a biologist, a, a graduate student, uh, Hamad Yusufpour, a postdoc, a visiting postdoc uh, from uh, Dresden, uh, Sebastian Aland, and then a couple of former postdocs now who have faculty positions, um, Baba Satsakiru in Dresden and Arnaud Chauvier in uh, France, and a longtime collaborator of mine, Vittorio Cristini. So basically, uh, tumor modeling and progression is a complex uh, multi-scale problem. And uh, the real challenge is how to um, basically model the interaction of all the different scales, you know, ranging from the sub-cell uh, scale of uh, molecules and DNA and RNA, um, how they uh, form proteins, how the proteins interact, how they tell the cells what to do, um, how the cells interact together with the environment. And then the whole process is coupled and then, of course, uh, you have the processes on the micro scale um, in the tumor microenvironment, which itself is very complex, which is interacting uh, through these mechanisms. And so the idea is, eventually, if one can develop predictive models, you can mechanistically connect the uh, subcellular dynamics to the invasion potential, the tumor morphology, and, the, um, uh, and essentially, understand how the tumors will progress and how they'll respond to treatment. So that's our, of course, ultimate goal. Um, and so let's uh, start by understanding a little bit about cancer. So it's really the loss of a tightly regulated system. So uh, this is just a cartoon of how uh, cancer could develop. Basically, if one has an epithelial tissue, so you have, in this case, it's a simple epithelium, so you have a single layer of cells above a stroma, which contains extracellular matrix, which is like the scaffold where the cells uh, live, and there's blood vessels and other type of um, uh, immune and uh, stromal cells uh, embedded in it. But if uh, the, there's a loss of control through mutations, this can lead to abnormal growth of the epithelium. So epithelial cancer is mainly what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, you... Uh, the cancer will start by uh, producing small nodules, basically that uh, are an overproliferation of cells. And then eventually, uh, they'll break through this membrane that separates the epithelium from the stroma and invade the local tissue. And this local invasion then can lead to metastasis, which is really what causes um, uh, death from uh, cancer. And so what in, uh, what's really regulated in uh, the bile and tissues is the uh, cell number. And of course, the cell number is birth versus death. And the traditional view is that cancer is a, a condition of the cell cycle. Basically, you have different uh, cycle times, and that leads to overproliferation and this dysregulation of birth and death. And that's an example of direct control. You change the speed at which cells divide, and of course, uh, the ones that divide faster win. Um, but 
In fact, control um, is not always exerted directly. And so here's an example uh, from engineering to kind of think about how uh, control might uh, be applied indirectly. So um, if you're in an airplane and you want to maintain altitude, well, the altitude is a balance of uh, lift and gravitational forces. And uh, if you want to go higher, you can't, of course, just lift your airplane. You have to change the uh, conditions. And so, of course, you do that by changing the wind shape with the flaps or changing the thrust with the speed. And these indirectly affect lift by modifying the airflow. And so, and in particular, uh, and when there is a crash, usually the failure of control is distinctive. And so cancer, is, uh, we're coming to think, is maybe somehow similar, that uh, if we can um, uh, understand how the control mechanisms are uh, holding for normal cells, then by uh, looking how the uh, um, how control is lost and the characteristics of tumors, um, we can go back and understand what control was lost. And therefore, if you understand what control was lost, you might have a chance to fix it. Okay, so in normal tissues, uh, basically, homeostasis and growth are tightly regulated, as I mentioned, and they're regulated via feedback. And so here's just a cartoon of, um, of what I mean by a, a cell lineage. And a cell lineage is, uh, basically starts with a stem cell, and then uh, the stem cell will divide. Some of, it, uh, uh, some of its offspring will stay at the same stage, remain stem cells, so that fraction we can call P0. And the uh, stem cells will divide with a particular rate, which we can call V0. And then 1 minus P0 of them will uh, progress and differentiate into um, another cell type, which could, we could call an intermediate cell type, or here a committed progenitor cell type. And then those, will do the those types of cells will do the same type of um, dynamics. And they'll produce, eventually, there could be many cell types in here. They'll eventually produce cells that are terminally differentiated, which no longer divide. And, um, and so this element, the lineage, is a fundamental element of tissues. It allows tissues to regenerate. And you have the underlying stem cells, which are then capable of regenerating the tissue. And it's the more differentiated cells that are the functional cells of the tissue. And what turns out to be the case so, is that these cells provide feedback uh, uh, among the different uh, cells in the lineage. And typically what's found is that the more differentiated cells are providing feedback on the less differentiated cells. And if one can develop um, simple, ordinary differential equation models of this kind of dynamics and discover that uh, feed that, of course, one could, has choices for feedback. One could change the division rate, and that's like the direct control. But it turns out that's not a very robust way to maintain control of this system. It turns out a more robust way to maintain control is to not, is, is uh, not necessarily to control this, but what's more crucial is to control the uh, differentiation probability. And if feedbacks act there, then that gives a, um, a quite a robust system um, that uh, can explain homeostatic uh, tissue sizes is very robust, so small changes in data will not change this, the solution, can give you rapid regeneration after wounding, and, um, and then a, a, um, a conclusion of this type of uh, modeling is that, in fact, these are not hard and fast cell types, but it's, the, the, it's behavior. Though um, what we call stem cell or committed progenitor cell really depends on the type and level of feedback present. So they both ha they have um, these cells have essentially uh, both types of properties. They could regenerate um, the tissue. Um, so this these bars indicate negative feedback, which means that these guys are producing something that lowers these rates. But what's also known is that there are positive factors that can increase these values. And the overall uh, behavior in the tissue can be a combination of these positive and negative feedback. Um, <clears throat> now, in that's normal tissues. Now, in cancer, uh, there is increasing evidence that uh, progression occurs as well, lineage progression. So um, I should define what that really means. It really means that there are cells um, 
a, a small fraction of them in tumors that are capable of self-renewing. So in other words, uh, producing themselves and producing themselves sufficiently to produce new cancer. And those are known as cancer stem cells in analogy with normal stem cells, although they may not be pluripotent. And there are many cells in cancer that don't have this capability, and this is the, uh, essentially what's known as the cancer stem cell hypothesis. Now, what one can do is uh, take a tumor, and one can identify these cells by um, essentially well, a variety of different mechanisms. Here I've shown it in terms of membrane markers. So this region of um, markers where these guys are medium and these guys are high are uh, indicating a collection of cells that seem to be capable of producing new tumors, these cancer stem cells. Well, uh, if one does cell sorting, then you fi they uh, find about 5% of the cells in a tumor. Um, in this case, this is a breast uh, tumor, a uh, breast cancer tumor, um, have this, these markers. So 5% are roughly stem cells. One can then take this, the, this tumor, dissociate the cells, sort for these stem cells, take essentially 99.9% .9 of them, take a, a collection of cells that's 99.9% uh, cancer stem cells, re-inject, grow, uh, re-inject it, for example, into a mouse, will grow a new tumor, and the percent, once you take that new tumor, you take out, dissociate the cells, and you discover about 5% are cancer stem cells. So this percent is very robust, um, at least within uh, certain ranges of um, time. And so that's suggesting that there is some type of feedback regulation, and there's control of the stem cell number, even in cancer. Of course, in cancer, uh, the stem cell number or fraction can be manipulated. It could be manipulated by mutations. Uh, it could be manipulated by the environment. And so here's an example where um, a chemotherapy treatment actually changes the fraction of stem cells from a, originally before a tumor, a, before the therapy, so around 6% to up to you know, as much as 20% or more. And it's this increase in um, stem cell population uh, that is believed to lead to resistance one of the mechanisms uh, for leading to resistance because stem cells are more robust uh, to, um, and can better repair themselves uh, after therapy. And so uh, since there is now uh, evidence for uh, lineages existing, they uh, should be feedback processes, and this loss of control should be connected to progressive loss of feedback regulation. And that, in principle, if we can understand the behavior of uh, tumors um, as they're progressing, their behavior and features should reflect the feedback modes of the growth control. And so ultimately, that's the goal of this type of modeling. And so from this, to, from understanding feature and behavior that emerges, we can then predict, try to predict what is going wrong. Now, of course, the challenge is that it's a multi-scale problem. So um, we have to, the, the biggest challenge is really bridging the scale. So again, it's a, cancer is a, a, a non-linear uh, multi-scale problem with the cell scale coupled with the, the sub-cell scale, uh, coupled with the cell scale, coupled with the tissue scale, and then the two, are, the, they're all non-linearly coupled uh, together. And so, um, uh, high performance computing is an, is an important mechanism to try to bridge the scales, but it's not enough. One needs to do mathematical modeling as well. And how, uh, and I'll uh, uh, describe how one can try to build models eventually to bridge the scales. Um, of course, another problem uh, is that unlike the physical sciences, it's often hard to get useful biological data. There's lots of biological data, but data needed to validate models is uh, not as widespread as it is in the physical sciences. And in part, that's because biologists aren't used to producing data that would modeling would need. And so further discussion um, between the uh, mathematicians and uh, physical scientists and biologists is needed to continue this uh, development and, and get data that's um, relevant. Okay. So um, in terms of modeling approaches, how one can 
uh, model cancer? Well, there's three main ones. So uh, there is discrete models where essentially you're tracking individual cells. And this is good for uh, targeting cell and subscale processes. Um, and, uh, but this is fairly limited because um, if you're in a millimeter cube, you have a, a million cells. And the computational effort by these types of systems then uh, limits the size uh, that can be modeled. Uh, continuum methods uh, deal with larger uh, scales. So um, there, rather than tracking individual cells, you track volume fractions or densities, and you're targeting tissue scale processes. Um, an advantage of this approach is that you can develop fast solvers, and you can do analysis uh, on the models. But of course, a disadvantage is that you can't describe individual cells or discrete events. Um, <clears throat> The uh, hybrid models combine both of these approaches, um, and uh, this is the method, these types of methods I'll talk about towards the end are uh, what's needed to bridge the uh, various scales. And of course, they, by being, combining these, they have the potential to um, combine the best features, but uh, still there's a lot of development that needs to be done. So I'm gonna start by looking at, at the continuum scale and uh, at the tissue scale. And I'll give you a kind of walk through a modeling effort that we've done um, at this scale, and then I'm gonna try to connect it to uh, bridge the scales. So uh, at the tissue scale, basically what we'll do is introduce volume fractions. So we can introduce volume fractions of the different types of um, tumor cells, uh, live and dead. There can be many components, as we'll need for the lineage. Um, we can define the total tumor uh, volume fraction, which is the sum of these guys. There can be host cells and there can be water. And then we'll assume that there's no void so that everywhere in the tissue, uh, the sum of the volume fractions is one. Then uh, we can simply pose um, basically mass and momentum balance equations uh, for these volume fractions. And so uh, we can have a conservation equation for the uh, cell volume fractions, but this will involve cell velocities and fluxes, as well as uh, sources and sinks. And for the simplicity presentation, we can assume that the solid and liquid fractions are constant, which means that everything has to move around um, uh, to maintain this property. And so uh, to close the system, we need to specify the velocity, the uh, fluxes, and the source terms. And so um, the main way we're going to do that is to uh, use a variational argument uh, and introduce an energy. And the energy will be uh, to model the cell-cell adhesion, how cells interact. And so here's just a simple example of you have uh, epithelial neural cells, um, classic example. And it shows that if you mix them together, they tend to phase separate, and cells of like kind prefer to stay with one another. And so one can use that idea basically to define an adhesion, ener adhesion energy or an interaction energy, so an energy between two cell types, and one can do it uh, like this, where uh, you can introduce an interaction potential that will describe repulsion and attraction between uh, the cell types. And then one can uh, take this and uh, do a localized approximation like what one would do in uh, theory of phase transitions and get a local model uh, that looks like um, a kind of Ginsburg-Landau type energy. And so then if you use a variational argument, you can identify fluxes and cell velocities that are related to um, the uh, variational derivatives of the energy and uh, and then the simplest velocity law you could take is Darcy's law, which is like an overdamped uh, viscous system. Uh, and so the velocity is just proportional to the force. And in the simplest case, you can just assume there's force from pressure uh, as well as the cell interactions. And then one can simplify even further based on uh, using that experiment as an idea that one can assume that the tumor cells prefer to be together and so one can introduce a double, classic double well uh, potential energy and assume that the energy just depends only on the total um, tumor population or volume fraction. 
and then this flux uh, turns into uh, just the uh, gradient, well, proportional to the gradient of the chemical potential, which is just the variational derivative. And of course, this leads you to fourth order nonlinear PDEs. Um, one can determine the pressure then by uh, assuming that uh, the all the cells move together if they're tightly packed, uh, then the, uh, all the cell velocities will be uh, the same. And, um, and then by summing up the mass equations, one can get a condition on the divergence of the velocity, which gives you a Poisson equation for the pressure. And then, uh, in addition, the cells need nutrients to proliferate, and so one can simply take a, um, a classic reaction diffusion system where uh, nutrients will diffuse. Uh, they, uh, they typically will diffuse much faster than cells proliferate, so one can drop the time derivative term. They'll be supplied by the capillaries and uptaken by the different cell species. Now, how do the lineage come in? Well, the lineages come in um, because they, uh, they're telling you what the different cell types are. So we'll model the uh, stem cells, the cancer stem cells, the uh, committed progenitor, and the terminally differentiated cells. And so then one gets source terms that are reflecting the fact that the cells can proliferate, and uh, they need nutrients to do so, and then they divide. So these are the net effect of uh, division and differentiation for the stem cells. So the stem cells uh, divide, uh, produce P0 of them, uh, and 1 minus P0 divides so that you get a 2 here. And then um, the cells can die by various mechanisms. The uh, progenitors can do the same thing. And then they just produce uh, sources of uh, terminally differentiated cells. And then one can track the dead cells by just uh, summing up all the uh, sources of death. And then in addition, there's clearance. The dead cells can be removed. Now, in, how do we put in feedback? Well, one puts in feedback by essentially having now a, a reaction diffusion equation. Again, it can be quasi-steady from uh, uh, soluble growth factors. That's we'll assume they're soluble. Um, that are produced by uh, different cell types. So the, in, uh, the simplest case would be to assume that they're produced by the terminally differentiated cells, and they're uptaken by others. And then how they affect the system will be to uh, change the, um, essentially the, free, the probabilities uh, that the cells will self-renew. And if one just put this into the model and does a simulation um, of the system I described, then one discovers that uh, not much happens. You, the tumor will grow, but uh, every, all the uh, fields remain spatially uniform. So then one can think, well, there should be other mechanisms going on. And um, the other mechanisms, well, one simple mechanism to include is uh, a positive feedback. So that was negative feedback. One can include positive feedback. And it's no, well known that uh, in many types of cells, uh, this uh, factor Wnt is, provides positive feedback for uh, cancer stem cells. And it's produced by, can, uh, by stem cells and cancer stem cells. And it, there's various inhibitors. So one can think uh, of doing reaction diffusion modeling, like Turing-type models for this type of system, would, that could uh, uh, have the potential to form patterns which one could think of as uh, niches for uh, cancer stem cells. Now, is there evidence for that? So, uh, well, what's known, for example, in colon cancer is that Wnt and uh, cancer stem cells are essentially synonymous. So the cancer stem cells are characterized by high expressions of Wnt. And here is a, um, in a vascular uh, colon cancer um, spheroid, so a collection um, uh, of colon cancer cells that's arranged roughly in a spherical shape. The green is um, expression of Wnt uh, activity, and one can see that uh, it's uh, quite heterogeneous, and as I'll show uh, later, the, um, the cells with this uh, high Wnt and they're not uniformly distributed. It depends on the size. And, uh, and there, it's also been very recently shown, so basically last fall, that in fact, uh, Wnt and DKK can be produced by uh, stem cells both. So, um, and so one can <clears throat> then 
uh, use that as motivation for developing a reaction diffusion model where the stem cells produce both Wnt and its inhibitor, and that can be um, nonlinear, like what one would have in the classical Gira Meinhardt um, uh, modeling, because there's many ways to upregulate Wnt, and so that gives the motivation for doing it nonlinearly. And so, uh, if one uses a classical uh, gira meinhardt model where you also tie ex uh, production to the needing the uh, uh, nutrients to be sufficiently large, then one can use this, uh, introduce this field and modify the um, self-renewal fraction so that one can include positive feedback. And so this is a simple form of positive feedback here and the negative feedback I showed before. Now if you combine those features, and now of course, you have a uh, highly coupled nonlinear system with fourth order equations. Um, one has to, use, to simulate this in three dimensions. You, of course, have to use um, efficient algorithms with adaptive mesh. Um, and we use finite difference nonlinear uh, multigrid methods with implicit time discretization, um, essentially using energy stable methods. So, uh, just briefly, what that means is that one can uh, discretize the system so that if you didn't have source terms, your energy would be, that cell energy would be non-increasing for any choice of time step, and so you can use large time steps. Um, the multigrid method of, uh, is well known, that, and here we actually use a nonlinear multigrid method, which means um, that actually we don't have to do global linearization, only local linearizations. So now if you combine those features, one can see what happens. And uh, what we'll start with is a, a collection of uh, cancer stem cells. There won't be any uh, terminally differentiated cells. This is the population of cancer stem cells and committed progenitors. And if we let this go, what happens is that immediately we form a pattern. And the uh, <clears throat> it looks like it's stationary, but all of a sudden, it starts to take off and finger. You see that in the um, total and the everything you can see together in the terminally differentiated cells. So these kind of holes at the boundary are the uh, cancer stem cells. And then you see it fingering. It will break up and, um, and uh, continue to grow driven by feedback. And you see you even produce new uh, stem cells from the um, from very low populations. And so uh, you get spatial structure, you get the uh, niches at the uh, boundaries, and unstable growth. And so why is the growth unstable? Well, the growth is unstable. Um, this is a, uh, the contour of the tumor. These are contours of the um, stem cells. And then this is the, um, the uh, wind distribution, and you see the wind is slightly uh, towards the boundary because uh, oriented a little bit more towards the boundary, off center from these guys, and that's providing high self renewal, and that's what's driving the fingering. Um, and so here's the self renewal fraction uh, also. And uh, this is the distribution of uh, nutrients, so they. Um, uh, there's a gradient into the um, cell, and this is the distribution of the uh, negative feedback factor that's produced by the um, differentiated cells. So then one can uh, fool around now and uh, vary the feedback response, and in this case is the feedback response to, neg to the negative feedback regulator. So this is a plot of volume as a function of time for a different uh, feedback response. So if there's no feedback, one gets this very dense system, uh, as one starts to increase the feedback, uh, the system uh, is better controlled, and eventually for sufficiently large feedback, and you get something that looks steady. It's not completely steady, but it's a, a nearly a steady state. And so not only are you, is the feedback controlling the size, it's also controlling the shape. And these are the fractions of cells uh, of the stem and progenitor cells and the terminally differentiated cells. And for all those simulations, they're fairly robust, around 15%, uh, uh, which is a bit high. Uh, and we're kind of limited to that by using this continuum approach. Um, <clears throat> but it's relatively insensitive to uh, uh, 
to the size. One can now extend to three dimensions and do the same type of thing. And now what you see is that there's fingers uh, that develop and their fingers are essentially driven just as in 2D by clusters of stem cells at the fingertips. So now uh, we have the model, we've put all those feedbacks in, can you validate it? it, does, it can we understand uh, if what it's doing makes sense? And so there was a, re uh, it's now about a year ago, there was a special issue in science about morphogenesis. And so um, in principle, the model that I showed you, well, could be cancer, but could be um, just a growing tissue that's interacting through these feedbacks. And one of the articles in this uh, uh, special issue is about growing um, what they call mini guts, what we call intestinal organoids, um, from a single intestinal stem cell. And so uh, this paper did it for human. In a previous paper, they did it for mouse. And so what you see here, this is their cartoon where they have their stem cell and uh, this, the organoid grows. Uh, you have this collection of uh, stem and supporting cells. This is the niche, niche essentially that drives the finger. And this is what the, um, what the actual organoid uh, looks like uh, in the human. And then this is a sample of what it looks like for the mouse. And the green is indicating the, uh, where the stem cells are. And then uh, if one looks at a proliferation map, um, one sees something like this. And so qualitatively, this is very similar to, uh, at least driven by the same types of processes that, um, uh, that we're modeling. So the question is, is it a coincidence? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. So now what would you do with a model? Now you start perturbing conditions. And so um, now we can try to, uh, what we do is we say, let's change the uh, wind sources in the system and perturb the system by in, uh, producing, essentially including exogenous sources of wind, which means basically putting wind in the environment. So in this case, that's the original um, simulation. Now we start to increase the wind concentration here and even higher here. And so what you see is that uh, as you're increasing the wind concentration, the uh, number of, these are the stem cell clusters, the number of clusters on the boundary increases. It grows larger and it's a bit more regular. And then as you increase it even further, now you have a more or less continuous distribution of stem cells around the boundary and it's a nice smooth and uh, quite larger uh, organoid. From, and that's predicted by the simulation. And then what uh, uh, these guys found is that they did the similar thing where they added wind in the environment and changed the levels. And so what you can see is that this is their essentially control. And then as they start to increase, this blue is indicating the stem cells. So you have something that's larger than this and certainly less budded. And then as you increase um, the wind, uh, these tend to be uh, bigger and more regular, just like what we, at least qualitatively, like what we would predict. So the trend uh, is quite similar. That was positive factors. You can do the same thing with negative factors. So now let's, uh, this is our um, a control. And now if you include high negative factor in the uh, exterior, one can suppress the budding and you get the uh, more stable, uh, smaller shape, which is consistent with what would one gets uh, from an experiment. Um, and so, at least from the perturbation point of view, the model is uh, uh, consistent with what's observed biologically. Um, and then, of course, since you can have the model, you can uh, do a lot more, uh, it's a lot cheaper for you to do uh, parameter investigation. And so, in fact, if we take that negative regulator, what I showed you was this case and this case, but if one does intermediate values, then what you actually can see that uh, it's not just that there's a, a uniform progression from this to a smoother shape. The shape actually becomes more unstable. And, uh, and so you have this non-monotone behavior. And in fact, uh, this guy, the tumor can even fragment. And this is suggestive of a dual effect of this negative uh, regulator. And it's well known in cancer that this uh, regulator can have this dual effect. And so that process emerges uh, naturally from here, although there can be uh, other effects of this guy that we're not modeling, such as increased cell mobility and things like that. 
So the model can make predictions. Um, now, uh, one can, so those were uh, normal. What about tumors? And so for tumors, um, uh, one can uh, use an imaging system that was developed by Frank Pionk at uh, UCLA. And so what they uh, discovered is that stem cells tend to have low proteasome activity. So they took advantage of that to uh, essentially fuse a green fluorescent protein to something that would ordinarily be degraded. So in stem cells, this glows, and in differentiated cells, it doesn't because it's degraded. So where you see green are where stem cells are. And so if one, one could do monolayer, so this is a, a brain tumor, uh, one can do monolayer, you see just a small cluster of cells, but if one does a sphere, one see, and this is a pretty small sphere, essentially um, this bar is 50 microns, uh, uh, there's lots and lots of uh, stem cells, but if one takes a sphere that's five times larger, uh, you start to see heterogeneity in the green, and again, you have these clusters, and these clusters are actually right at the boundary of the tumor, so maybe a little bit easier to see. This is a confocal microscopy uh, image of the tumor, so you can see these clusters of uh, high stem cells, and they're actually right on the boundary of the tumor, which is kind of flat here in three-dimensional. So uh, there, again, it's suggestive that the growth is driven by these uh, stem cells at the boundary. And that's a bit different than the uh, conventional thinking, which was that the stem cells had been in the interior of tumors, kind of hidden away in hypoxic zones and regions where there is low nutrients. But in fact, the model suggests otherwise, and that's consistent with the data. So now the fact that there's lineages and feedback, you can, you can then say, well, let's devise therapies that might be more effective uh, for treating tumors. And so, uh, well, what happens with traditional therapy? Well, in traditional therapy, one, uh, and the real problem is the cells become resistant to it. So how can they become resistant? Well, one idea is that there's this um, emergence of the stem cell um, uh, compartment, uh, larger fraction of stem cells, and the therapies tend to be more effective for the more differentiated cells and less effective for the uh, stem cells because they have better, essentially, repair mechanisms. And a problem, and so that leads to a, a dual problem with the stem cells. First, that um, uh, they're killed less, and second, when you kill the differentiated cells, you relieve the negative feedback. So you enhance them because you relieve them from feedback. So you get higher populations than you would ordinarily think of just by uh, killing these guys. And, um, <clears throat> and so then one can say, well, what if you treat both uh, com the stem and uh, differentiated cells differently? So what if one used a traditional therapy and combined it with a therapy that tends to drive differentiation? So these therapies exist. Um, and then one can see what happens if you do this. And so here's an example. Um, this is a plot of uh, total volume as a function of time. Uh, so the blue is if you did nothing. Um, and so this is an example of the tumor at this, uh, in this kind of metastable phase. It will eventually start to grow and invade. Um, at this time, you treat. So if you treat with just a traditional therapy like radiation, well, you dramatically reduce the size of the tumor, and, um, and, and you get rid of a bunch of these clusters. So this is what the uh, tumor looks like. But as soon as you turn it off, you get this rapid rebound and rapid growth that leads to then uh, invasion and this question of whether this is more invasive than that. At least it's about equally invasive here. Um, if one does differentiation therapy, that's this red curve. So there you're driving the cells to differentiate. So you go, the uh, volume drops, not quite to the levels of here, but then as soon as you turn it off, you go up rapidly to where you were before because essentially the feedback mechanisms are restored and it drives the system back. But if you combine these two, then you can drive the tumor down to zero. And, um, <clears throat> and it's quite robust. So you take two therapies that don't work and combine them, and they're effective because they're hitting different populations. And so here you can see a little bit why. Um, 
this is the volume fraction of the stem and progenitor cells as a function of time. When you, hit the th when you turn on therapy, you get this rapid um, increase in the fraction going all the way up to about 35% of uh, stem cells. And then as soon as you turn it off, the, uh, the system tries to get back under control um, and it, it comes back down. But you've dramatically increased the population, which is very consistent with what's observed uh, experimentally. So this is an experimental image after um, radiation treatment. Uh, again, the green are the stem cells. If you do differentiation therapy, you drop the populations, um, but then they're under artificial feedback. So as soon as you turn it off, you the population of stem cells rapidly increases to respond to that um, and uh, to less feedback, and then the, this repopulates the tumor. And uh, this is just the analogous thing for the terminally differentiated. But if you combine them, you, uh, you drive the, essentially the stem cells really down to zero, and that's very unusual in a continuum model that it never comes back, and it's because of the feedback. And one can then go further, and I'm not going to show the result, but one can develop machine learning out. You can, now, this was just one example. So now what you can do is you can vary the conditions, you can vary the parameters, uh, and you can then use machine learning algorithms to correlate outcome uh, with the uh, pre-therapy tumor morphometrics like shape factors or fractions of cells that you can try to get, for example, from a diagnostic. And it turns out these are very predictive, at least based on our model, the artificial data generated by our models. Now, just in the last uh, few minutes, um, then I'd like to talk about how one bridges the scale. So that was the continuum scale. You can get a lot of information from the continuum scale, um, but you, of course, make a lot of assumptions, and you're limited in certain ways. So you're limited, for example, because you can't describe transitions from because the, the continuum scale is dealing with the collective motion, uh, the collective behavior of uh, cells. Uh, you can't look, find uh, basically model transitions from collective to individual base motion. And this can happen, for example, during what's known as the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, um, which can be triggered by a number of uh, different effects, for example, low oxygen, um, where cells stop moving together but uh, reduce their adhesion and start moving individually. And this is believed to be a metastatic precursor. Um, <clears throat> also, when your uh, cell volume fractions or densities are small, uh, then stochastic effects are important. Now, one can include stochastic effects, uh, in fact, we did in the modeling, but, uh, but uh, stochastic extinction is hard to do in the continuum model. And so, um, uh, for example, when you have very small stem cell fraction, so we were up at about 15%, well, realistically, you're more, it's more like 1%. It could go as much as 10, but it tends to be closer to 1. That's really hard to do in a continuum model. And also, at the invasive fronts, the cells they can tend to be spread out, and so you tend to have low densities of cells at the invasive fronts, and so stochastic effects are important there. And so that leads you to uh, then, at least from the, uh, from the continuum perspective, then to say, well, let's try to build hybrid methods. And so there's been a number of approaches uh, for trying to do that. Um, one is a, a, essentially a decoupled approach uh, that Paul Macklin uh, led, who actually is a former a PhD student of mine, um, who uh, basically took data at the uh, individual cell scale, upscaled it to um, parameters in an agent base model, and then upscaled uh, the behavior um, and uh, averaging the parameters at the agent base model to get parameters for a continuum model that then could be used to predict tumor size, uh, and quite well, actually. So this is a plot of uh, the, essentially an equilibrium tumor size versus this uh, upscaled parameter that relates birth and death processes. And these points are experimental data, so it lies uh, pretty well. Um, but this is decoupled, so this is decoupled from that, and in fact, this could feed back. So a, a coupled system was developed by um, uh, Kim and Othmer and Stolarska, where um, they took, tried to take advantage of the fact that at the um, uh, proliferating edge of tumor spheroids, uh, 
there is fewer cells than in the whole spheroid together, in particular the cluster. Uh, so this edge tends to be only about 100 to 100 microns in thickness. And so they used individual cells here and then converted them to, to, to continuum when they um, became quiescent or necrotic. So they tracked only uh, cells in this boundary. And we developed a, another approach where we introduced transitions between uh, continuum and discrete uh, points, uh, basically uh, marked by these blue dots, uh, together with a vasculature. So the yellow are sprouts and the red is um, our looped vessels that are producing uh, blood flow and oxygen and nutrients. Um, and so under hypoxic conditions, the, there could be this uh, EMT, the transition, that can produce these uh, blue cells that then move out and disperse in the tissue. But then if they get close to blood vessels and there could be angiogenesis and new blood vessels form, they can then convert back to continuum. And so you can generate this multifocal type tumor. So these are uh, existing approaches, but they have limitations. And their limitations are basically that... Um, you essentially pre-assume the continuum equation. So, uh, <clears throat> and in fact, one shouldn't necessarily do that because the continuum equation we're dealing with may not be the limit of the discrete process in the, under the right conditions. And then the second, of course, is that there, uh, in the, all of these systems, there's really phenomenological rules for changing between the continuum and discrete representation. And so um, what we're trying to do now is develop methods to overcome those difficulties. And I'll describe a couple of them. Um, one is if we really wanted to get away from having to write down continuum equations, one can try what's known as the equation-free approach um, developed by uh, Janos Kavrikides. And so here uh, what we did with Janos and a student of his um, was to develop an equation-free model for a simple cellular automata model of tumor growth. And so here, the idea is that you switch between uh, the fine scale and the coarse scale by essentially identifying coarse scale variables that tend to evolve slowly. And in this case, it's the radial cell distribution because under the simple growth law of the cellular automata, the uh, cells grow in a circular cluster. And so one can then uh, go back and forth by um, essentially taking, if you run your cellular automata model, you can restrict, and in other words, construct the cell density. You can uh, take representations of that. You can evolve on a large time step. Um, and then you can uh, reconstruct a discre the, uh, from, uh, so in other words, you can advance far. Then you could reconstruct the uh, discrete representation by lifting the, uh, this guy back to here and do a small burst and then um, continue in that way. And if you do that, you actually can do pretty well in matching the, um, uh, the evolution. In this case, it's just a traveling wave that moves out. But so far, it's been limited to fairly simple configuration. So here's a way you can do it without ever having to know the continuum equation. Um, there's advantages, though, if you know the continuum equation, um, because you can do more theory and analysis and um, potentially develop faster algorithms. And so I'll just uh, briefly describe one of the ways we've tried to do that by uh, using um, essentially dynamic density functional theory. And so uh, the idea is to eventually to try to develop a, a mesoscopic framework derived from the microscale and, um, <clears throat> and include correlations like one does in uh, density functional theory. And so just very briefly, um, if I have a couple of minutes, um, how this works is the following. So if you have interacting particles, so you can think of these uh, particles as cells, so that uh, you have points that are describing the center of mass of cells, well, they can, if we take an overdamped model, they'll, um, uh, they'll interact by, inter they'll interact by uh, specific interaction forces, um, uh, and then they'll also uh, be affected by external forces uh, from the environment. And then, of course, there's a, a stochastic effect. And one can um, introduce a coarse grain density, which is essentially an ensemble average density, 
and then uh, by uh, averaging and uh, minimization, one is led to this density functional equation. So this would be kind of classical um, density functional theory. And so uh, you get a uh, essentially reaction diffusion equation where um, the, that's based on the derivative, uh, functional derivative of free energy functional. And that free energy functional has um, essentially um, uh, diffusional effects, so uh, entropic effects, and uh, ex effects from the environment, from this external potential, and then this uh, um, excess energy, uh, which is really not known, and that's how the uh, cells are interacting. And so, um, one of the ways that this is dealt with in uh, density functional theory is to expand around the reference density. And so, um, and then uh, doing so introduces the um, two point correlation function um, of the system. And this is again not known, but one can start to try to model this. And so, this is reminiscent now at the very beginning of this adhesion energy that I introduced before with a non local kernel. And then if uh, one puts this together into the PDE, you get this uh, non-local PDE um, that has uh, essentially dispersal of cells by diffusion. Uh, cells can move with respect to external forces. So this could be like uh, chemotaxis, uh, if you have gradients of something that is driving cell motion. And then interaction terms. <clears throat> and then one, to this uh, framework, one could end birth-death processes. And so, well, that's a complicated system, and we've developed methods for dealing with it, but let me take, uh, one can go a bit farther, at least at this point, by uh, doing some additional modeling. And so, um, uh, just a word about the you know, direct two-point correlation function. In fact, in principle, if one can get images of the cells, one can extract this from experimental data, but otherwise it could be modeled. And uh, what we did is we modeled it um, just using a simple uh, uh, first peak approximation of this correlation function, the first peak in Fourier space. And then, um, and then if you do a, also expand the logarithmic uh, term, you can get a local approximation, which is the, um, uh, this density. And then minima of that are essentially oscillations. And these peaks are where you think it's likely that cells are located. Almost done. So one can develop an algorithm based on that to derive the equation. And let me just show you uh, quickly some uh, result uh, in the last second. So um, here what we did is to try to validate the model, we looked at the growth of uh, epithelial cell clusters and compared to an experiment um, by Pugliafito and looking at uh, kidney cells. And uh, this is what the model will do. Um, so these are the, the uh, virtual cells, and they're getting smaller because in this system, uh, if there's not enough space to divide, the cells can't grow. They just divide based on their clock, and they uh, will divide, and they'll eventually reach some limiting size for which they can't divide anymore. And one can plot the area of the colony as a function of time, and uh, at the early stages before the cells become contact inhibited, inhibited so that their cell, um, their areas start decreasing and uh, they stop being able to divide, you get a exponential growth with a deviation in the experiments. They only did a short time. We were able to do longer time. So here's the model results, the experimental growth, and then the deviation. Um, you can see in experiments there's a, a period of roughly constant cell density till um, you start having deviations uh, from the exponential growth, and then the density starts to increase, again, similar in the model. Um, and if one tracks the uh, single uh, cell area, that will also decrease. And if you track the radial distribution of cells, um, at early stages, uh, everything behaves uh, kind of like a gas. There's no limiting factors, but then solid structure emerges, and you start to get peaks in the radial distribution function. And one can also look at the topology by looking at number of neighbors, and that matches as well. So now one can take that framework, and just the last simulation I'll show, is now include lineages and feedback in this guy. And uh, this is a model of a basement membrane. We have um, stem cells here, and then the stem cells can divide into progenitor and terminally differentiated cells. 
and they're interacting through solid, uh, soluble factors. And so the stem cells are along the basement membrane, but eventually you'll see they can try to squeeze through. And then once they do, uh, here we assume there's not really any barrier, they lead invasion paths. So uh, just to conclude, um, basically uh, the idea is that we've developed this model, we've tried to connect the scales uh, with the last thing I show, and then um, between the uh, discrete and the continuum, the next feature of this con uh, connecting the scale would be to go to the tissue scale, but now we can use some uh, upscaling techniques that have been developed for uh, dynamic density functional theory um, and to try to do that, essentially amplitude and phase type expansions so that we can actually get to uh, the, the uh, tissue scale. But then we still have a lot of work to do. We have to quantify the uncertainty. Um, we have to have better parameter estimates and really more detailed experimental validation. I mostly showed correlation rather than uh, matching a specific experiment because we haven't had access to enough data to do that. Okay, with that, let me stop. And Thank you very much. Take any questions. No, thanks again, John, for this wonderful talk, and it's very insightful and inspiring. So, are there any questions? So, how, how much of these uh, things you collaborate with experimentalists to try to guide them or to direct them in what things to look? Are they receptive to this kind of analysis? Uh, not all of them, but some of them. So, the ones we collaborate with are kind of by um, evolution. So, we don't, we, um, but uh, for example, uh, Arthur Lander uh, and his group are trying to do uh, detailed experiments of this self-renewal fraction P. So we've made a lot of assumptions about what P should look like and how it behaves, and so now they're trying to do experiments to really assess, and those are difficult experiments to do because um, the self-renewal fraction and division rates are kind of intimately tied. It's very difficult in an experiment to uh, determine cause and effect, and that's essentially what they're trying to do now is to say at least uh, are these fractions consistent with what the model would predict. Are there other questions? Uh, it's time. I think everybody's ready for coffee. So <laughs> let's thank our speaker again.